I'm Anna Garwood. I'm the director of artists and content at Pond5. Um, if you're not familiar with Pond5, we are um, a video-driven media marketplace. And uh, I'll, I can talk more about it in a, in a minute. I don't know if you want me to explain more now. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll go into it in a moment. Okay. Uh, Penny? Oh, hello. Um, my name is Penny Lane. I'm a film director. I've made a lot of films, shorts and features. Um, my third feature-length uh, documentary is called The Pain of Others, and we'll talk more about it later. Um, I'm Joshua Handler. I'm the founder and programmer for the Handler Film Salon, which is a small, uh, intimate group um, focused around showing films that are underseen, underrated, or in need of rediscovery. I'm Maxim Bazdarovkin. I'm a film director. I've made various features that are archival and various sorts. I think I'll talk about two of them here. One's called Our New President, which is a story of Trump through Russian propaganda, and one's called The Truth About Killer Robots. I just played here. Wonderful. Um, we're going to go, uh, actually in this order, we're going to go Anna, Penny, and Max. Uh, so Anna, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Pond5 and their work with, uh, with Archival? Yeah, so, uh, so I'll just give a, a quick background on Pond5. So uh, again, we're a media marketplace uh, founded in 2006, so we've been around for about 12 years or so. And um, you know, the, the company was originally founded um, to help filmmakers bring their creative visions to life. Uh, we're known for being the world's largest collection of royalty-free, licensable video clips. Uh, we're at 13 million now, which is pretty incredible. Uh, we had a, a demand for archival footage, you know, specifically historical footage from our, our customers. So about a year and a half, we built the collection. It's at, at about half a million clips now. Um, so we're, we're very excited to have built that collection, and it's been doing really well for us, and we're constantly adding to it. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of different types of users who use our content, filmmakers, um, corporate clients, um, advertising agencies, YouTubers, all kinds of people. Um, but and, and use our, our archival you know, footage in various different ways. And so we have a short film I want to show from Anne Holliday, who is a filmmaker who used um, archival footage in a really unique way. So we can just show it and then talk about it. The whole uh, idea of the film was to tell stories of women's experiences with objectification in modern society. And so she conducted several audio interviews, as you heard throughout the this short film. And um, when she was trying to figure out how she wanted to visually represent those stories, um, so she went down the path of of using like real footage or you know um, reenactments of these experiences, and it didn't quite feel right. So she played around with the idea of using archival footage and specifically birds, <laughs> which kind of plays off um, you know the sometimes offensive terms of calling uh, women chicks or birds. And so um, I thought it was a really unique way to sort of play off of of that using using. Um, this bird footage. Most of it was uh, licensed from Pond5, which is pretty cool. Wonderful. Uh, did you have uh, any direct involvement in uh, the creation of this film? Uh, I did not. I cannot take, take claim for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, what's also interesting about Pond5 with the size of our collection, you know, I mentioned we have 13 million clips, um, around 500,000 now of archival clips, is that... Um, we have, if you have a very like specific idea in mind, there's a good chance you're going to find that idea visually represented or something close to it on Pond5. Um, and you know, we, we have different sourcing capabilities to find um, new and existing footage. So if you have something specific you're looking for, you know, we can actually help you source that. So it's it's pretty pretty cool that she was able to find, you know, her vision, um, you know, using using clips that we have. And so briefly, uh, briefly going off of that, um, what, tell us a little bit about your specific work with Pond5 and what you do. Yeah, so um, as director of artists and content, I work on the contributor side of the marketplace. Um, it is a marketplace, so we have people who uh, monetize their, their footage that they own the rights to, um, as well as people who, who license it from us for various different productions. Um, I'm, I keep mentioning video. Uh, we are a multimedia marketplace, but we're really driven um, by our video collection. We also have music sound effects, photos, after effects, 360 videos, 3D models. Um, so we kind of cover the range. Anything you need to uh, you know, bring a, a vision, a creative vision to life, we have the tools that, that they can help supplement that. Um, so I work with, uh, we have um, 
over 25,000 video. Uh, my team specifically works with the video contributors. We have over 25,000 of them worldwide. And um, what's uh, also unique about Pond5 versus other marketplaces is that we are very artist friendly. We give 50% revenue payout per license. Uh, we allow our contributors to set their own pricing, um, which attracts a lot of people to the marketplace uh, to work with us and a lot of people exclusively working with us. And um, so I help um, determine you know, what kind of content is in demand from our customers, um, what type of content is selling through uh, to, so people can know, OK, well, here's what I can contribute. Um, so that's really like, uh, that's specifically about um, new footage that people are going out and shooting. And then there's also the archival. So my background before I came to Pond5, I worked in development. I developed um, TV concepts. So I have a lot of relationships uh, specifically with nonfiction television production companies. And so I kind of have a pulse on what types of things are, um, are trending in demand, what kind of concepts are being developed and produced. Um, you know, a lot of archival driven documentaries, TV shows, and films um, are kind of having a resurgence right now. Um, some examples are like LA 92 about the LA riots. That was like a purely archival driven uh, documentary piece uh, with no sit down interviews, you know, no other way to tell the story except for the actual footage, which is pretty powerful. Um, I was kind of obsessed with Wild Wild Country on Netflix when that came out. You know, that was like this um, hidden archive um, uh, footage that the Oregon Historical Society stumbled on and reached out to the filmmakers and they were like, hey, we found this amazing footage from this crazy stuff that happened back in the 80s. Like, do you want to make a film about it? And so that's how that came about. Um, you know, so I, I love, you know, all that stuff. I, I like to you know, my dream is, you know, now that I'm at Pond5, is to find those, like, hidden caches of <laughs> rare or unseen footage. You know, that's the other thing, is, like, never seen before footage is also um, something that's pretty powerful um, to develop, um, you know, TV shows and films about, uh, because it's it's amazing. You, you literally literally cannot go and recreate this stuff, so, find you know, finding that, that footage that people haven't seen before is really amazing. And there's there's been a resurgence in archival recently, uh, you know, used, used in film and television. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think has led to this resurgence of archival and these archival-based films? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think that a few years ago when people mentioned that, uh, you know, there was an archival-driven um, documentary series or a film, like, you automatically think, oh, like, uh, old dusty war footage that you know, like, or like that appeals to like a 75-year-old, <laughs> you know, looking, you know, looking back at at old footage. But um, you know, a lot of young people are really fascinated by um, you know archival-driven concepts, and I think that the power of actually seeing um, the real events uh, and and just how visceral it is, um, and I think it, it connects you a lot closer to those experiences when you actually see them. And just the way that um, people are becoming more innovative with the usage of archival footage. Um, so for example, Three Identical Strangers, I don't know if you've seen that yes. film, but um, I love how it's interspersed with archival footage of the actual events of the, of the brothers growing up, mixed with some reenactments to sort of thread the story along, and then the sit-down interviews. So I think they did a really inter innovative job of, of retelling that story with intersp interspersing it with archival footage. And it really like brought it to life in a different way. Um, and so, uh, so Penny and Max's films um, are largely comprised of footage that has uh, been sourced from online. Um, how has YouTube um, and you know the rise of all of this footage uh, being put on YouTube impacted Pond 5s work? Yeah. So, um, hang on. I actually have some stats about YouTube because I'm just, I'm fascinated by how much <laughs> content is being created now. Um, yeah. So on YouTube specifically. 400,000 videos are uploaded every single day on YouTube. That's <laughs> incredible. Uh, 30 million visitors per day, and then uh, over 4 billion videos viewed per day. Billion. <laughs> that's like, 4 billion. That's a massive amount of content that um, is being uploaded and viewed on YouTube every single day. Um, so it's for us, from our perspective, um, we're actually, um, you know, getting some some perks out of all this content that's being consumed and created. Um, so that there there are there are a couple challenges. One of them is is that you know there's all this content on YouTube. So if you're using it specifically for commercial purposes, you know, there's some hoops and hurdles that you have to go through to uh, make sure that you clear that footage that you find on YouTube. So um, you know, there's been a, a resurgence in the rights and clearances. Uh, you know, companies that are helping to clear that footage so that you can use it for commercial purposes. Um, and then, you know, 
I go back to the, my background on TV. So um, having worked in development, I know that one of the biggest challenges these days is to get a concept sold. It's very hard. There's so much competition out there right now. And um, you can't sell an idea on paper anymore. Like, it's rare that you can do that. So you basically have to pitch shows with sizzle reels. Um, and you want the sizzle reels to look good. <laughs> so you want to find the footage, the best footage, wherever you can find it. So a lot of people are, are creating rip -um um, you know, ripping footage off of YouTube and other places just to get their idea across visually however they need to. Um, so we wanted to address that because the problem is, is that if you pitch that to a network or wherever you're pitching it and they fall in love with a specific clip or a piece of footage and you don't have the rights to use it, then you're, you're kind of fucked. <laughs> so, or you have to spend a lot of time and money to go clear that. So um, we created a sizzle reel license at Pond5 where um, you, know, you can use Pond5 footage, unwatermarked, high-res um, clips for the purposes of development projects to try to get your idea sold. Um, and so, you know, if, if and when it does get picked up, um, then you know that, um, you know, whoever is the commissioner, uh, they know that, that that specific clip can get cleared and licensed. So it's been really helpful, um, in, specifically in the TV production community, having that license um, available for them to help sell shows. And we've had some, um, a good amount of successes from that. And then on the flip side, um, for YouTube and other, and like Instagram, all of these uh, social media outlets, it's this explosion of content that's being created. Um, but at the same time, it's usually like shorter form, smaller budgets to create this stuff. And so um, it's a little bit um, cost prohibitive to go out and shoot everything originally for, for these different series on, um, on social media platforms. Um, so we're actually seeing an uptick in people coming to Pond5 uh, to get their production elements to help them create these shows because it's, uh, you know, it's more cost effective to use existing material as opposed to creating everything originally. Um, so we're, you know, we're seeing an advantage with that. And uh, we actually, um, this week, just launched a beta for this new uh, product called Social Studio. Um, it's really geared towards uh, uh, creative agencies and advertisers who are um, you know, creating short form social media pieces. And so we have templates that they can easily like, pop our content into and create campaigns. Um, yeah, and then, so yeah, people are coming to us a lot more, really, because there's so much more content that's being created. And so, uh, so segging from that into uh, into Penny, who uh, who has a film comprised entirely of footage uh, found online. Uh, Penny, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Pain of Others? Sure. And your work? Sure. Well, yeah. So one thing is, um, uh, yeah, I've been working with what I would call found footage um, for a long time, um, and I, I just to, distinctions that I find useful in my personal lexicon. I'm not suggesting these are tried and true like definitions for everyone, but I think of found footage as any pre-existing material, and then within that, I think of archival footage as one category. Like in an, the, the distinction for me is that archival footage is related to an archive, and an archive is a specific institution with bounds and an archivist who makes choices about what to save and why. So that's kind of one thing. So I don't think of the pain of others, which is entirely sourced from YouTube, um, kind of amateur content on YouTube, specifically vlogs, which is a terrible word that I can't believe stuck. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> vlogs is what makes up YouTube, and I don't think of it as an archival film per se, whereas our Nixon kind of was, because our Nixon was made up of material that came almost entirely from an archive, the Nixon Presidential Library. So just a definitional thing, um, and then just to throw another one out there, because it makes me nuts, stock footage, which a lot of people use as a term to cover all of these things, I think of as being like, when you're trying to like create something that looks seamlessly embedded into a film that you shot, you know, so you might get like a stock shot of New York City at sky, you know, over the bridge or whatever, because it's cost prohibitive to go and get that. So I think of stock footage as being like the type of footage that is not meant to call attention to its pre-existing existence before you used it. That's how I think of it, which I don't know if that's how other people think of it. But I bring it up because for me, the interesting thing about found footage is that pre-existing authorship so that when you use it, you're negotiating with its original use like automatically. You can't help that as the author of this new film. You're kind of dancing with the original creator unless, again, it was made to look like so bland as to be not authored at all, if that makes sense. So with The Pain of Others, it's essentially a YouTube compilation film um, that's made up of 
blogs posted by women who uh, have a disease called Morgellons disease, um, which uh, the symptoms of which are um, itching, crawling, the feeling of insects under your skin, um, lesions that break out over your body, uh, mental fog, brain fog, depression, anxiety, and also um, blue, black, red, and green um, sort of fibers that look a bit like threads growing out of your skin. And the medical community uh, at large has determined that there is no such thing as Morgellons disease, that it's a kind of mind-body syndrome um, that is a delusional disorder, that people are essentially imagining these long, strange colored fibers coming out of their skin. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and I sort of heard about this community of people who had kind of gone to YouTube in search of answers, um, people who believe they have this disease, who um, are trying to get help and trying to also prove that they're not crazy. Uh, so I thought it was an interesting phenomenon, and I made this film made up of these clips. And do you want to cue up the clip that? Yeah, uh, I think have? we could just watch this one. Yeah. So it. essentially, this comes about a third of the way into the film. There's three main characters. This woman's name is Marcia. Um, and she has gotten herself a microscope, and she's um, in the process of trying to analyze what's going on with her body. So that's the clip that you're, you're about to see. You'll hear her voice, and you'll see her narrating her footage. Can you tell us, uh, what, did you, what, did you find, uh, what did you find this clip from? Well, again, like, it's, it's, a, it's a very simply constructed film. I, you know, I chose three women in the YouTube Morgellons community to focus on, and then everything in the film is, is from one of their channels. Uh, so, so, you know, YouTube, YouTube is uh, footage that's around for, uh, for public consumption, um, but when, when you're trying to get the rights for something like this, did, did you have to get rights uh, to use this footage? Uh, did, were you in contact with the three women? Um, how did you go about that? So, you know, there's different ways to ask that question. Like, there's legal things, there's ethical things, there's just creative things. So, you know, so legally, um, I worked with my lawyer and determined that we had a very strong fair use case for every use in the film, so there was no legal need to, to clear the material with the mm -hmm. creators. And we don't have to get into that, but there just wasn't. Um, and then uh, ethically, I felt um, a lot more complicated about it. Um, that women in my film are extremely vulnerable. They're, um, in some cases, really straightforward about their struggles with mental illness. And um, you, you know, there's a sense that they feel like they're a bit on the on the edge. And, and they talk about struggling with suicidal thoughts in many cases. And so. You know, I had to really think about whether the film, like, was in any way, if there was any possibility of the film harming them in some sense. Um, so I did reach out to them. I didn't ask permission per se. I, I sort of said, here's the project that I'm working on. Um, using some of your videos in this project, I'd love to be in touch. And without, again, going too long into the story, like, none of them were interested in really participating in the film. Um, you know, one of them had moved on to like different conspiracy theories and was kind of embarrassed by Homer Gellin's past. And then another one um, just said like, good luck, but you know, unless, you're ex unless you are planning to expose the government cover up of, you know, the bio weapon known as Morgellons that came from chemtrails, I'm not interested. And then the third person just kind of wasn't interested in, in talking to me. But they never watched the link. I sent them the link. They never watched it. So it sort of curious lack of interest in my weird art film. Uh, but not that curious if you think about it. It's just a weird art film. You have to remember, like, they have, like, hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. Like, what I did has a very small audience. So it's not as if I've dragged someone out of obscurity and, like, put them on the big silver screen. Like, it's really the opposite dynamic at play. Like, they are very famous in their own worlds and have, you know, again, between the three of them, millions of views and viewers. So my weird art film doesn't really cross over into their lives in any way. You just said something interesting. You said that um, that one of the women has moved on to mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to other conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, is the implication of that that, that this is a conspiracy, or, well, or that this is a conspiracy theory? Oh, I mean, there's no doubt if you watch the whole film that there's that all three of them are heavily into various conspiracy theories. Yes. Does that mean that more gallons itself is? I'm, I stay objective on that question in the film, um, but there's no doubt that there's a big overlap between 
people who believe they have this disease and people who think that like chemtrails are controlling their minds. So speaking of uh, staying objective, um, you know, you, you, well, you do stay very objective in your portrayal of these women's intensely personal uh, videos and their suffering. Um, do you ever find it hard to present a clip, um, you know, such as this one, uh, with, uh, with or without your, um, your personal views and opinions? Well, this clip's a little bit uh, almost misleading because most of the film is presented even without mu like the musical intervention here is mine, uh, and I think it's pretty has a voice. <laughs> you know, that's pretty pretty specific. Um, most of the film doesn't have that kind of intervention in it. So when Joshua says it feels objective, it's really just because it does play like literally just a series of YouTube videos with very little overt editorializing from me. The whole movie is extremely editorialized, obviously. Like the structure of the film is very much my own original creation. Um, and it's structured in a way where they all kind of go mad. Um, but you can interpret that the purpose, I mean, sorry, the cause of that madness in various ways. So it's kind of left open open ended in terms of how you interpret what's going on with these women and their experiences. Nowhere in the film do I say anything about what I think is happening. Uh, and no, I didn't find that hard at all. It was the only ethical film to make. I mean, I, I don't know, at the end of the day, anything about Morgellons as a scientist. So, you know, I have my opinions, but it would be unethical for me almost to put them out there when the question is as unsettled as it is in the world. So, so does that make sense? Like, it wasn't hard for me not to share my opinions because I didn't think that was worthy. I didn't think my opinion mattered very much. Well, that makes sense. Uh, and what do you feel that, uh, that, this, that this kind of found footage uh, mm -hmm. brings that you know, newer footage and new interviews with women like these ones mm -hmm. uh, brings? Yeah, people ask me this a lot in Q&As, like why, why I did this instead of going and say interviewing people. Well, you know, there's so many different ways to answer it. Um, it there's, there's a kind of like, at a certain point in your career as an artist, you get to just decide what you like doing and you don't have to do the things you don't like doing. And for various idiosyncratic reasons that are none of your business, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have gone out and spent time with these women and interviewed them and asked them to tell me about their suicidal thoughts on camera. I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing it for a variety of reasons. It's not because it's a bad thing to do. I just don't want to do it. So there was something about the, the, in, the thing that was interesting to me was that dance with the authors. Like they're, they're already representing themselves in my medium of nonfiction cinema. And I was interested in the way that they had represented themselves. Uh, and that was part of the subject of the film. It was not so much about what my ideas about how to represent them were. It was more like, wow, this is how they're making their arguments. Here's the kind of evidence they're marshalling. Here's the sort of, you know, watching them think out loud on film in their own vlogging sort of interior space that was interesting to me. And I had no interest in going out and interviewing people or talking to a scientist or something. I just didn't, wasn't interested. That was a level of a voyeurism. Oh, it's extremely voyeuristic, but also like, I think it's important to say this, that I was able to extend my empathetic understanding to these people. The film's called The Pain of Others. I do not necessarily relate to them on a, in an obvious way. Uh, I think most of what they're saying seems overtly insane and laughably so. If I were sitting there trying to talk to them on camera, I don't know how I would deal with that, but being able to be at home alone, uh, you know, having my responses with the mediation there allowed me to spend the time. It let me stay in the room. In real life, I would make for the door. It, with these mediated <laughs> objects, I sat in a room with these women for thousands of hours, and I think I was able to get somewhere with them empathetically that I wouldn't have been able to do in real life. So that kind of voyeurism thing, I don't think it captures the totality of what happens when we're able to access people's you know, sort of worlds through their own media. Like, it's, it's, it goes in di a lot of different directions. And I felt that it allowed me to get closer to them. And moving on, uh, moving on to another one who uh, looked into other people's worlds um, <laughs> with his medium, uh, Max. Uh, do yeah. you want to tell us a little bit about um, sure. our president? I mean, I'll, I'll start Max. actually, I think, where Anna made a really gr a good sure. point from the beginning is that we are living in this time where it's kind of that just a massive communal archive is constantly building up. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more of these films that are largely archival or li largely found footage and reliant on them. And to my mind, like the big shack on documentary that makes so many documentaries just utterly boring and difficult to watch, is just how, is this kind of literalness and earnestness. 
And I think that with working with archival, you see a lot of this in films, the films that do well, that go to Sundance, blah, blah, blah. But it's just they do not know how to think about archive in a way other than illustratively. I'm just saying, this was what it was like, blah, blah, blah. I'm showing you this because it's what a poor person's house looks like. And I think that there's such blind spots that come out of that. And for me, the most important one is that it doesn't, if that's the only mode that people are primarily working with archive, and I'm going to accept Penny here because she's an exception. And if that's the, largely the dominant mode that people are working right with, you don't have a chance to really grapple with the way that these media constructions of reality are actually forming our, ourselves as people and forming our understanding of the world. So um, a couple of weeks after Trump won, I've, I've always been interested in kind of history of found footage and like propaganda and things like that. So two weeks after Trump won, I was thinking, OK, how do you do something about Trump that's not earnest, that's not, because ultimately, if you're intellectually honest, like everything that was done about him that, that you know, criticized him only contributed to the media cult that existed around him. So how do you use satire? How do you use other ways of working with footage to get at something else? And so what, and at that point, um, my co-editor and co-composer on Our New President came back from visiting his mom in Russia. And he goes, well, you know, everyone's really excited about Trump. They keep on calling him our new president, our new president. <laughs> so we were like, OK, this is fascinating. And so the reason for in this thinking, I'll show a trailer of the film in a second. But um, the thinking was that all the people that are excited like this, they have no firsthand experience of America, no eyewitness experience of American electoral process. So, so, by, so what we tried to do is to make a film that tells the, year, the story of the election and fir Trump's first year in office, but entirely out of news and factual television, but without a single true statement in it. So literally everything in it is bullshit. And then people on YouTube are regurgitating this stuff. Because I, the, the idea of working largely in a purely archival way was that you can create almost this hermetically sealed vacuum of, and see the way that the disinformation travels. And I think that, again, pushing away from a certain kind of literalness in approaching archive is really liberating in the, in the kinds of critiques that you can do as a filmmaker. So let's show the trailer for ONP, our new president. Okay, so the whole movie is like a 78-minute lobotomy. And, um, <laughs> so, but, um, but, you know, you kind of learn a lot about the way that some of this stuff works. And, and you know, the history of found footage filmmaking has so many of these examples of working with archive and undercutting it. And, you know, and, and there's so much kind of artistic opportunity to kind of reclaim the meaning. Because essentially, when you're making a film like this, it's very pure because you're just kind of constantly fighting for authorial control over the material and to interpret it in like a different way than it, than it was made. And so, yeah, you know, so that was uh, an idea of this film, yeah. And how, how did you find yourself fighting for control over uh, how this was made? Well, because you know, it, it's almost when you're go when you're making a film like this, it, it's always falling apart under sort of a weight of its own randomness. So when you're going through, you're constantly trying to figure out how you can uh, reinterpret or repurpose a piece of footage which created was created for one thing, but then present it in a way that still s stays true to this kind of evolving voice of your film. And so I think that you're kind of you know you're doing it with sound design, you're doing it with juxtaposition, you're doing it with every single kind of tray, you know, filmic technique. But the idea is that there's, a, there's almost a way of, when you break away from a certain kind of literal representation, all this other shit opens up to you. All these kinds of incredible twists and turns and associative thinking and all, and all these things. And a lot of times, we're just kind of locked into that sort of, I think that the real shackle on documentary, like I said, is not really lack of creativity or lack of artistry. It's a certain kind of even arts events that are very, very literal, that I'm showing you this because you should know this and you should learn this in this way. And, you know, and, and fiction films aren't like that. They have their voices much more varied. And I think that that's our like, last journalism, shackle of journalism that kind of you know, weighs things down. And when depicting, uh, when, sh when using somebody else's footage, how, how do you keep a balance between, um, and Penny, you might be able to speak to this as well, between um, putting yourself in there and keeping, and keeping yourself out and letting the footage speak for itself? Oh, I don't know. I, f I find that when I'm working, it's just a very kind of myopic. You're just sitting there and you're working. So I think that my ideas sort of come through, but they come through the conceit. And in a way, the, 
I mean, I could talk about the, the truth about killer robots is a film that was just a doc NYC and it's on HBO November 26. And um, that film is a film about the sort of the perils of automation, but told through three stories where a robot kills a human. And there, you know, the idea, and this is maybe where my perspective comes in, is how do you take sort of make literal death and kind of metaphorical death speak to one another? And as a way of kind of using a true crime premise to talk about ultimately boring things like structural economics and like labor economics. So that's what we tried to do for the film. And within the film, there are people that say good things about robots, there are people that say bad things about robots, but you know, there's a kind of a dystopian frame around it. So I always feel like that my input is really at the conceiving the form, the formal device that's going to create and that's, that the film will sit in. And then one of the beautiful things about documentary is that the nature of a material, the nature of the people that you meet, our, our Killer Robots is virtually only has one tiny bit of archive that we can, that we can show, but, but that, you know, the world that you can create can sort of come out of that and it can have competing perspectives and it doesn't have to, doesn't have to have a single perspective that it's easy, but you know, it's still, you know, my film's still called The Truth About Killer Robots. It's still, it's still you know, will make you scared of robots. So, you know, so that's, that's why I feel like that then, then you actually should just push yourself away. And this is a kind of a, you know, in, in it's like Tolstoy always had this thing where he was always had this moral side of him and in later work he would always just be really, really put it out there and be really, really kind of overly moral and that wasn't as good. And whereas in things like Anna Karenina, what's amazing about it is that he's kind of keeping his own moral judgment at bay while it's still in there, it's still in the, in the, you know, in the architecture. And so, you know, I think that that's, it's always that kind of balancing. Penny, do you have anything to add to that as well? Yeah, I mean, as Max said, I mean, you know, it's not like found footage filmmaking is new. I mean, some of the earliest films you can go to in the history of cinema are found footage films. So, you know, we've always had, so there's, there's a lot of examples to look at. And so when I teach found footage filmmaking, you know, I try to get my students to think about, like, what kind of technique are you using here? It's not just that you're using archive. Are you making a collage? Are you making a compilation? I think of The Pain of Others as a compilation film because it's not a collage. It is like sort of a compilation of events that are strung together in a way that's uh, fairly literally, I mean, it's not a collage. A collage is like when you take two things and you smash them up against yeah, my each other. Arnie President is a collage. Yeah, it is, right absolutely. And I think our Nixon is. So right. there's just different techniques. Like when you take two things and you're trying to like force them up against each other to make new meaning, I think of that as collage. And then there's like sort of newer uh, things that come out of the sort of YouTube world, like super cuts uh, or fan videos or, you know, and that's kind of its own set of techniques and, and language. So I just think it's helpful. Or you can be quite literal. Mm -hmm. And I've done this too. I mean, the, the panel's called way more than B-roll, but guess what? I've used archival footage as B-roll. It's an okay thing to do. It's just a very literal, specific thing that you're doing. You're making an illustration of something that might be hard to illustrate otherwise. So it's not like these are good or bad ethically or something. It's just good to be aware of what kind of technique you're using. You know, because it really does, it, it keeps you in line. It, it keeps you from slipping, Joshua, to answer your question, you know, to keep your voice sort of consistent. You know, you sort of have to be aware when you slip from collage to illustration, it might feel off in your sort of film because you're like sort of not noticing that you're doing it or something. And I find a lot of people who are not familiar with archival, and I'm sure you see this all the time, they're trying to make the, they're, they're trying to ignore the original author, which is a perfectly fine thing to do, but it's actually quite difficult with many types of footage. You know, unless, again, you're dealing with the sort of most um, kind of familiar, like, newsreel footage we've learned to accept as objective, which is a really weird thing, if you think about it. Like, we're supposed to be super media literate and understand that that's authored by someone with specific ends. But nonetheless, you know, most of us just go, okay, that's what happened in World War II. It's in a newsreel, it must, have, must be true. You know, um, or again, stock footage, which is designed to kind of seamlessly blend with, with whatever you're doing. So most of the time I find that the trouble people run into with archival is they're trying to erase the original author and they're, they're frustrated because they can't figure out why they can't, you know? Like a home movie image has the marks of a home movie. It like sort of immediately makes you think about who's made it. You know, so I don't know how it's much. It's like you the find problem of film theater in a way. What's that? It's like the problem of filmed theater. It's right. the same thing, yeah. Yeah, and like you mentioned home video footage, actually, um, like the whole idea of nostalgia, you know, people really relate to, especially these days, like 
that's actually some of our best selling uh, archival footage is old home videos. Okay. Yeah, and um, you know, it's like you wonder, like, who are those people? <laughs> and um, and you know, people often uh, you know use that in different interpretations. But I really think, like, especially now, um, I think that because we're so technically advanced and people are glued to their devices, like the whole idea of nostalgia as like a throwback in simpler times is something that everyone can relate to. Um, so it's it's interesting that, that you bring that up. And what do you feel has uh, has made this wave of nostalgia come about? <laughs> I mean, we always have nostalgia, but why? Why now? I think it's because like everyone's just overwhelmed with everything that's happening in the world right now, and like with the political, you know, environment that we're in. It's just like, um, and and just everything that people are bombarded with constantly. I think that, um, you know, hearkening back to simpler times when, um, you know. You literally like use a telephone with a cord <laughs> on it, um, and and you know our footage that people use are oftentimes like comparing like the uses of technology back then versus today, um, or even just like you know the simple act of a family sitting down and eating dinner together <laughs> at, a, at you know at a dinner table. So you know it, it's it's I think like that whole like you know the throwback um, to to when time, times were a little bit less easier. <laughs> people are relating to. One final thing before we open it up to you guys uh, for questions. Uh, Max, with, with our new president, uh, were you ever in contact with any of the uh, creators of the, uh, the videos that you used? Yeah, eventually. I mean, uh, our new president is sort of a weird case because it's like, it's literally like the exception that should prove a rule of, of, of a, uh, in other words, there's no reason that why that movie should be legal other than the fact that since it's made entirely out of propaganda. So getting it legal <laughs> was a big, big nightmare. As part of that process, I didn't initially feel like we, we reached out to some of them specifically for some of them that like, there's a lot of found music in it that's like amateur music with people singing songs about Trump and stuff. So initially the lawyer we were working with uh, led us down many uh, foolish paths with that. We, I mean, we got it legal, the movie streaming now, but, um, but uh, so we did have to contact them. Most of them you know, didn't really care. And, you know, I think that actually there's a way, and I think that maybe Penny was also getting at this, there's a way in which the legal standards that exist for a sort of ownership of footage that like lawyers and fair use lawyers will come to you with is sort of radically different from what the common concept of people that are dumping footage on YouTube is. And there's this kind of disconnect, and I think that we're seeing this a lot with technology in general, where even like a lot of the legalistic standards move so much slower than the technological advances, where there's just kind of a crash. Like you see this, you know, in, in the Killer Robots film, you see this a lot with kind of with models of culpability following deaths that are caused by machines, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, but contacting people a little bit, yeah, a little bit. Most people are. I want to just say bit. one thing about sure. that because Max is reminding me. Like a lot of people, and he's completely right. Like our our common understanding of how sort of culture works is very different from like a technical legal sort of thing. And so one thing that people don't understand is that you know if I ask you how do you copyright this photo that you took today, like people think, oh, I have to go to the copyright office and like file. No, you don't. Actually, in 1978, we changed the law of the United States. Every single thing you make is copyrighted automatically, including every text message you sent. Like technically speaking, the copyright is so insanely entrenched that in practice, this is why fair use has become such an important thing for people to understand. You're not like cheating or like getting away with something. Like you have to have a robust understanding of like fair use principles because everything is copyrighted off the bat. And most of you don't give a shit about your stupid text message you just sent. You don't care if someone cites the garbage you put on YouTube 10 years ago. People don't actually care that much about the, the amount of material that we are producing is insane. So, like, you have to kind of accept that the idea of citing and quoting and is 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 protected. It's okay. It's not something sneaky that you're like getting away with, which is how people tend to think of it. They're like, oh, I think maybe, yeah, I, I don't want to tell anyone that I that my whole movie's fair used. I'm like, it's like okay, like it's just in the law. Like that's on purpose, you know to counteract the fact that we've gone crazy by copywriting everything without even thinking about it. With that, I'm going to open up to you guys. Uh, who, has, uh, who has questions? Uh, if anybody has a question, just raise their hand and I'll call on you. I do want to quickly, because I say so much about fair use and I take some of my stuff off the internet, say that like 
huge chunks of what I do involve working with companies like Pond5 or other sort of licensing entities, and there's a million reasons to do that. Like, so I just want to be clear that, you know, it, there's, there's reasons to go to YouTube. For me, like, this film is about vlogging. So clearly I went to YouTube, but the film that I'm, like, in post on right now, like, the most of the stuff that I'm using that's pre-existing came from uh, news archives or Pond5 or other archives, and there's a zillion good reasons to do that. I just want to say that because I don't like to set up a kind of any sense that there's any kind of conflict. Like, licensing footage is a really good thing, too. Well, yeah, I mean, my conflict was that I couldn't, I mean, I could probably license it, but I'm, you know, would never want to pay the, like, the Russian propaganda networks and RT money. <laughs> so oh, wait, I have a story about that, which is one time I used an image that I could only find by purchase. This is the worst this is like my confession. I had to buy a DVD from the KKK, what? and I like had to give them twenty dollars, and I freaked out and like gave two hundred dollars to the Anti Defamation League just because it felt like better in my heart. Yeah, you know that you know that was, nineteen like, of those dollars were going to a distributor. <laughs> it was the worst. <laughs> no, no, no. It came straight from <laughs> straight to the KKK. Yeah, man. It was like straight really painful. Straight to the Klan Productions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to, I have to ask you. What, what was this DVD? Oh, believe it or not, yeah, it's, no, a, it's a clip in my uh, movie about the history of sea monkeys. So you'll have to watch what? the sea monkeys <laughs> movie that from? to find out why I had to buy a KKK video. You'll find out if you watch it. <laughs> There's someone handing it up in the back. Yes, back there in the blue. Um, well, it's different. I mean, for me, I think that it's just figuring out what the... I think with any movie, I think that what I like about documentaries is precisely that, at least for me, the process is thinking about what the material that exists and then essentially inventing a form, a film form, that could carry that material. And so I think that for Our New President, it was weird because it was a movie that was made effectively in real time, that we were making, you know, it... Um, it premiered earlier this year, but it literally we just made it for, edited it for 56 weeks as all this stuff was unfolding. So there was a lot of kind of give and take between the actual current events, and we didn't know which, you know, some detours in, in the world of Trump like wouldn't materialize into anything relevant to Russia. So then, but then I think the process was very pure with this kind of film, because like you know that, you know, you can't, it can't be a minute longer than like the bare minimum. You know, because it's unwanted. So you sort of just make a, you know, an 80-minute film, and then just making it make it better and better. And so that kind of refining and finding the voice, and then just moving. So I think it's it's very kind of I find these films to be much more pure and kind of intuitive, because you don't have any, you don't really fetishize the material as much. Like I hate all the material in it, you know, equally. <laughs> but you know, it's infuriating. But you know, but then you know, and then you have this kind of second-level postmodern love of it as well. But. You know. <laughs> So it's just kind of... You must have had a lot, of, a lot of edits with, with this film. Yeah, I, my <laughs> joke was that we won the editing award because it has the most cuts. Yeah, <laughs> it probably does, yeah. And things are always, always happening. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, it, again, it really depends on the project. Like, there are, like, R. Nixon and The Pain of Others are projects that were born from exactly what uh, Max said, discovering an archive, discovering a kind of cache of material, and then finding a form to carry it. Like, so those films were very much like the, the initial idea came from the archival discovery process. And then I did a film called Nuts, and the film that I'm finishing right now that'll be out next year are very different. Their films where I had an idea of a story I wanted to tell, and then the archival search was in service of that story. So they're totally different processes. Of course, I just, and again, this has to do with just personal preferences. Like at a certain point in your career, you could just be like, you know what I like? I like to stay home in my pajamas and fuck around with archival. It's more fun for me than shooting. Shooting is a fucking nightmare. Pointing at camera people is rude. I like don't enjoy it. So I just like it. Like, so for me, like the more time I can spend at home in my pajamas, like messing around, maybe getting high is great. <laughs> and then the time I have to spend like shooting to create material, I feel like every minute of a shoot, I'm like, I bet this shot exists somewhere already. Like, it's like, like, like why am I bothering to create this exterior of an empty warehouse in Detroit? Like, I could call Pond5 and get that shot now. So I just have so much less patience for it. 
I'm learning and getting better at it, but it's not my favorite thing to do. So just to answer the question of like the artistic process, you just do what you like. I mean, that's what we should all be doing. We should be doing what we like. And I mean, I guess I'll just add on that. But for me, though, some of that, the other film, The Truth About Kill Robots, had this archival kernel at the core of it, which was this footage of Isaac Asimov in the, uh, in the 50s talking about this thing that he came up with in a, a short story called The, uh, the uh, Three Laws of Robotics, and the first being that a, law, uh, a robot cannot kill a human. And the idea that this is this thing that has existed in both science fiction and, uh, and sort of robot design for all these years, and then these three cases that we went and filmed because I, I saw all the other stuff that was done about robots what had all these blind spots and wasn't interesting to me. So here it was required to go out and basically film and make the entire film. But it still came out of, okay, there's this moment that all these other contemporary incidents are sort of testing and revealing certain kinds of discomforts. Exactly what he did with, uh, you know, when he introduced the three laws of robotics, it was precisely in a short story collection which would show the way that all those laws and implementing them would fail in practice with robots. And so I thought that from the beginning, let's try to make a film that sort of feels like a science nonfiction film. It takes things from the uh, from sort of that identifies futuristic things in the present and builds a world out of that. And so, but again, so it comes out of that kernel, but then you, then in this case, you know, I didn't, there was an archive that I could find to realize this idea and it had to kind of go between this metaphorical death and literal death as a kind of organizing principle. So that film just kind of came out of thinking through this. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We have time for about one or two more questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'll tell a very kind of uh, accessing uh, uh, archive in places where. Um, International. Yeah. I mean, our new president opens with a scene where it's this excavation of a mummy in Siberia who then cursed Hillary Clinton when Hillary Clinton came to visit it. So that was a long journey of trying to get the footage from that Siberian archive. But, but sort of a more political and sometimes the dangerous side of it is that I made this movie about Pussy Riot. And, um, a Pussy Ride film, a lot of the core of it was this footage of the trial that the women were put on. And uh, at that time, the, the people who handled like court reporting were not, it was this organization called Ria Novosti in Russia. And they were kind of exempt from the general kind of shift towards propaganda at the rest of TV because they weren't considered uh, main, they weren't considered media, they were considered sort of like informational reporting. And so a lot of like the decent kind of journalists or, or people that felt uneasy about what was happening in Russia were kind of hid out there. And as we were, si and I was working with low res proxies, proxies for a while, and as um, we were finishing the film, we still hadn't had signed the contract, and it was announced that, that it was kind of newscaster that you saw at the beginning of the trailer, He's really, really awful, but he's, he was like the head propagandist that he was put in charge of the entire media and this organization was being swept under his command. And so and I, I freaked out because I knew he was, and we managed to sign the of a contract in, like within a week, and then three weeks later, uh, a friend of mine who was also trying to do something, he was trying to license that footage, and it was impossible. So the door's been closed on that footage ever since. So you know, I think that it's it's kind of feeling it out, and a lot of times in those places, I think it becomes much more about the personal relations, and you know, going to archives, bringing a bag of coffee to people, uh, talking to them, and then explaining what you're doing. Because also, when you make these weird movies, it's really kind of people have these models in their head of what films look like, especially what documentaries look like, and then you know, so a lot of times you have to do the legwork and kind of give them a sense of what you're doing. We have time for one more question. There's a lot more nepotism in the rest of when, when the archives are disorganized. <laughs> yeah, then the back. Yeah, I can. I'll just say briefly. Like that is one of the one of the upsides. I mean, if you can access your sort of primary 
source material and you're making an archivally fueled piece, like it does really help the pitching process as opposed to having to raise money to go out and shoot. So you know, it can actually be quite useful in, in development to be doing archivally fueled work, I have found. Uh, also, if you're but there's also skepticism. I think, and you mentioned well, yeah, no, I was going like to say also shit. like that the, the over the last few years, like things have changed quite a lot. So I remember when I was pitching our Nixon, you know, back in like 2011, and it was an all archival film, and people were like, "Really? How is that going to work? Who's going to narrate it?" You know, and I'm like, "No, no one's going to narrate it." And they're like, "Really? Has that ever been done? That seems crazy." And I'm like, "Yes, it's been done thousands of times in the history of cinema, whatever." But you know, it was seen as an odd thing. But then, luckily for me, like as I was finishing my film, Senna came out, and Senna was a big hit and was all archival. Although they did real, they did in our audio interviews that no one ever talks about. So it's sort of all archival that people thought was all archival, and it was like I was like, "You see, it's going to be like Senna," and then people. Or like souls, you know. So it helps if uh, it's already a trend, I think. Uh, you know, and then the so by the time I I did like a, well the paint of others I didn't raise any money for I just made it so that helps too. And yeah, I, I guess I think that we both had sort of shame, sh shamefully somewhat easy times getting financed between because uh, our new president was financed by Impact Partners who were talking in an adjacent venue yes. about how to get money. So yeah. <laughs> it may have been a more worthwhile uh, conversation. And um, I mean, I think that uh, with that one, I also had made it, I made it as a short for Field of Vision first, and then built the feature out of that. So yeah. I don't know. I've never pitched an all archival film. But yeah. But it's always like, basically, if a film is going to be not about a celebrity, right. and kind of deviates from any kind of very, very, con or like about an important issue of access, like it's just gonna be a pain in the ass to get her financed. And yeah. you know, if you know people that like your work, you're lucky. Yeah, I mean, look, everyone has it hard. The only way to pitch a movie that's gonna be easy to pitch is to say, it's going to be exactly like this other movie that I've already made. Mr. And then Rogers people are thrilled. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, people are psy super psyched. Like if, if my follow-up to our Nixon had been our Reagan or something, it would have been like check easy, but it wasn't. So it's just if you want if you want to do something new, it's never going to be easy, and that's fine with me. Like no one owes me money to make films. This is like really fun for me. So I'm pretty lucky to get paid to do it at all. Ditto. And with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, Anna, Penny, and Max, thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for coming to this today.